Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are the one who gathers us. We are not here as a church by our own initiative, but rather by the will of the living God, the one who hung the stars in the sky, who said, let there be light when there was none. You have redeemed us and brought us here. So we pray now that you would open our eyes to your word as we continue to look at this glorious chapter that points towards our glorious future. We pray that it would not be another religious exercise on a Sunday morning, but rather would be what is meant to be a life-changing reality, a hope that makes all the worst pains of this world look like nothing. We pray that you would do that by, our, by your spirit, by opening our eyes to your word. We love you and pray in the name of your son. Amen. We've been going through 1 Corinthians 15 for several weeks now, which is one big argument on the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. So we talked about how each of these will build on each other. So several weeks ago, five, four or five weeks ago, we looked at the foundation for Paul's argument, Jesus's resurrection of first importance. Paul preached, Christ died for your sins, was buried and was raised and a whole bunch of people saw it, right? It happened. That's the foundation. Then next, Jeff taught us about the consequences. What are the consequences for denying the resurrection? That's what the Corinthians are doing, denying the resurrection of believers. And Paul says, if there's no resurrection, then Christ wasn't raised, our preaching is in vain, our faith is futile, and we are of all people most to be pitied, right? Pretty big consequences for denying the resurrection. We then saw the next week, but Christ has been raised. The reality, Christ has been raised, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. His resurrection is the first taste of your future resurrection. As he was raised 2,000 years ago at his second coming, you will also be pulled out of the ground because he's the first taste of the future resurrection. And then last week, Tim walked us through, you know, somewhat of a confusing passage. Paul's like, why else would you get baptized on behalf of the dead? And we're like, I don't know what you're talking about. And Tim helped us show that last week, Paul's saying essentially, this reality of the resurrection should affect your behavior, should affect how you live. And then this week, Paul, in this big passage, is finally going to get to what I think most of us have been wondering, what is your resurrected body going to be like, right? As we're hearing about all these things, we think, okay, yeah, this is great. What's that going to be like? What's it going to be like to be resurrected? And so we're going to see Corinthians ask these questions, and Paul's going to give them some answers. Uh, I have two kids that I mention every single sermon, so this is just for the new people who haven't heard of Harvey and Joe. Uh, Harvey is my two-year-old boy. Joe is uh, my one-year-old girl. When you hear a baby crying later, that's her. Uh, so uh, Harvey in particular is at this place where he's asking tons of questions, as kids do. Not all of them make sense. Like a bird will fly over our head and he'll go, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't know how to answer that. Birds, it means birds fly and you don't, I don't know. But some of them, you know, a lot of them actually do make sense. I, I, I rope Harvey into my kind of morning routines, so I have him help me pack my, you know, backpack with the Bible and books and all the things you need for, you know, to come to church as a pastor. And so every morning, can I uh, help you pack? You know, can I help you tie your shoes? Which means hold a string while I'm trying to tie my shoe in spite of his help, right? And he's asking all these questions. The main question, though, is, is Joe going to get my toys? He's going to go to the bathroom, and he wants to take all 5,000 toys with him because he doesn't want Joe to get him. So he asks all these questions, and his questions, one, reveal his little two-year-old heart. They're not very innocent, right? Is Joe going to get my toys? What's that revealing? A selfish little boy who wants everything for himself, his sister to get nothing. So his questions reveal a heart, and then my answer to his questions reveal truth, reveal reality. I say, she may, bud. Joe may get your toys, but it's okay because those are her toys too. Right? So his questions reveal his heart. My answer to those questions reveal reality that should change his life. That is exactly what's going to happen in our passage today. The Corinthians are asking, what will the resurrection be like? What kind of bodies will be raised from the, uh, from the ground? And we're going to see there's a heart behind that that is not just asking innocently. And Paul's answer is going to reveal to us what is true, what is reality, what is this life-changing future hope that we have. So our overview today is going to be simply walking through these questions. Number one, how are the dead raised? How are the dead raised? Number two, what kind of body will be raised? 
And then number three, who raises the dead? How are the dead raised? What kind of body will be raised? And then who raises the dead? Look at verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now, be honest. How many of you, has that been the main question you've been wondering for the past five weeks? Right? That's what I've been wondering. Wow, this sounds great. Jesus is the first fruit of our resurrection. We're going to be raised like he is. What's that going to be like, right? Let's see Paul's response to this, what I think is a natural question. You foolish person. And so I imagine myself like sitting at Paul's feet. What's that going to be like, Paul? Fool. I'm like, yeah, stupid, stupid question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not wondering. Why, why is he responding like that? Why is he responding like that? And this is actually key to understanding the entire passage. What is the Corinthians' main sin? If we can ask that question. This church is a mess. We've been, I don't know how long we've been in this book, but we're just going problem after problem after problem after problem that Paul is having to address down to denying the very hope of their salvation, the resurrection. What's the key problem that we've seen kind of as a red thread through all of that? Pride. Arrogance, self, uh, self-righteousness, whatever label you want to put on it. Pride, right? They have prideful divisions in chapter 1. I follow Paul. Oh, yeah, well, I follow Peter. Oh, well, I follow Jesus. Beat that, right? This, this kind of arrogant attitude. We saw this with spiritual gifts, right? I've got the best gifts. We don't need your measly little gifts. Just exalt me, right? Very, very man-focused, prideful. And then so we've got that. that's the main problem. And what's happening in this chapter? They're denying the resurrection. And so what we see here in these questions is they're not just kind of innocently asking, they're mockingly asking. They're not really even asking at all. They're very arrogantly asking. Essentially what they're saying is, okay, how are these dead people supposed to get undead? Are we just going to wake up one day and claw ourselves out of the ground, right? What kind of body is going to come up? This old decaying body that we're going to be in for all of eternity? That sounds like fun, right? They're just kind of mockingly asking. So imagine uh, our, our newest staff member and deacon is D.J. Hoffman. He's been great. We'll see how he keeps doing, but thus far he's been doing pretty good. Uh, and so D.J., he, he is great. Uh, and so imagine he comes into my office. I have an office with a window. I'm not bragging. That's just a fact, okay? Uh, and imagine he was saying, hey, Courtney, his wife, Courtney's going to bring me lunch. Can you just keep an eye out? Uh, and whenever she, you see her coming up, can you text me so I can go open the door? And I respond, sure, yeah, I don't have anything else to do. You want me to just sit here and stare out the window for four hours until I can just make your life better? I just asked a question. You can very obviously see what's behind that. Get out of my face, okay? I'm I'm busy thinking about how to preach God's holy word. I don't have time to, you know, see when your lunch gets here. That's kind of what's happening in Corinth. They already know, or they think they know, there's no such thing as a resurrection, but let's ask these kind of arrogant questions to prove how right we are and how dumb Paul is. And so Paul is rebuking them right out of the gate. You fool. You fool. You've forgotten the very core of your faith. So he rebukes them, but then he actually is going to pastorally answer their question. Look at verse 36. What, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other kind of grain. Okay, so he's rebuking them, but then he's actually going to answer their question and using this analogy of wheat seed going into the ground and coming out is this analogy that almost all of them would have (laughs) understood. Robert Gundry, who's a commentator, says this. (laughs) Paul uses an analogy that even a stupid objector should understand. That's my kind of commentator right there. Okay, so... A seed, you guys are like, great, Jared's going to teach us about farming. I did my research, okay. A seed, right, has in and of itself, it's just seedness, but then also all that's going to spring forth from that seed. But to get a tree to come from an acorn, right, it has to go into the ground and die and pop off that little hat thing and spring forth the big oak tree, right? And Paul's saying that's exactly what's going to happen in the resurrection, unless this body goes into the ground, dies, and is planted into the ground. The life, the resurrection life, cannot come, foolish person, arrogantly asking this question. How are the dead going to be raised? You've misunderstood a core element of the gospel. Unless death comes, resurrection life 
cannot come. And this isn't just something to do with our resurrection. This is a truth you see all over the scriptures. Jesus, John 12, 23 through 25. This is right before he's about to go to the cross. In between this statement, there's the upper room and then his arrest going to the cross. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. That's him. Here's us, 25. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So that's true of Jesus' work. Unless he dies, there's no victory over death. Unless he dies, your sins have not been paid for. The wrath of a just God is hovering over your head. Unless he dies and defeats death in his rays, which we know is what happened. And so now, because he has gone, died, and been raised victorious over death, we can have life in him. You see that life is on the other side of death. That's true of him and his work. And then notice again, verse 25, that's true of us. Every time Jesus calls disciples, if you love this life, you won't have eternal life. You'll lose it. If you hate this life, if you pick up your cross and follow me, if you lay this life down, you will find true life. You see that. Death is a necessary step to get to true life. True life is on the other side of death. And so Paul's pointing to that same truth here. You're arrogantly asking, Corinthians, because you've forgotten The core of the gospel, true life, comes on the other side of death. This tree can't spring from the seed unless it goes into the ground and dies. And then verse 38, he actually gives them a deeper answer, if you will. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. How will the dead be raised? Simple answer, God will do it. That's the deeper answer. God will do it. God's the one that brings this transition from seed to plant. God brings this transition, this transformation of your dead body going into the ground and being raised to resurrection life. The Corinthians have forgotten, really, the, the, the greater core of the gospel, that God is the one who saves. Philippians 1, 16, He who began a good work in you, Notice, not you who began a good work in yourself. He who began a good work in you. When you were a rebel straying away, when you hated him, did nothing good, had no desire to follow him, nothing good in you, no one is good, no one seeks God. When you were there, he redeemed you and began a good work in you. He will, be, uh, he will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. God not only justifies you, He also sanctifies you and will raise you and will glorify you. He's the one doing all the work. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. Almost this picture of, you know, a carpenter, a woodworker, or someone writing a poem, right? Intimately working on you, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And the fundamental message of the gospel is that you and I contribute nothing to our salvation except... As Jonathan Edwards says, the sin that made it necessary. That's what you and I contribute to our salvation. God, because he is rich in mercy, because he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, sends his son to save us. He's the one acting. You and I are the ones being acted upon. Why would it be any different with the resurrection, Paul is saying? Why would it be any different with the resurrection? The Corinthians' main issue here, the heart of these arrogant questions, is they've taken their eyes off of God and placed them on man. That's what pride does. Lowers your eyes off of God onto man. What can man do by his power? What can, you know, think again about the spiritual gifts. Look how great I am. Look at what I can do to build up this church by my own strength. So focused on man, they've taken their eyes off of the God who saves. Of course the resurrection would be a ridiculous idea if it were up to man's power. And again, they've forgotten what is impossible with man is possible with God. And this is not an issue. You know where this is going. Talked about the Corinthians. Now we're about to fun application point. This is not an issue with the Corinthians alone. You and I, in the flesh, though we may not have denied the resurrection, constantly have eyes that drift down off of God onto self. 
why are you so stressed at work? Probably because you're looking to your own strength, because you're looking for your approval from your boss or from man to see that you're doing a good job. You're looking for your satisfaction in man and not from God. Why are you so paralyzed about your children's future? Probably because you think you're in control of it. You're the one who's going to present the gospel well enough so that they can be saved. If they're not, it's your fault. You're the one who's going to make sure they get into a good school and have a great life. If, you, if they don't, it's your fault. You probably think you're in control of it. Your eyes have drifted down. Why does the latest news cycle just take you out emotionally? Probably because you somehow think man is in charge of the future. And when man does something stupid, now God's all of a sudden confused, like, oh, I didn't know they were going to do that, right? Your eyes have probably drifted down, causing anxiety, causing stress, causing fear, causing all the things that happen when we let our eyes drift down. All the while, our God is saying, set your eyes on the things above. You and I, children of the living God, if you're a Christian, children of the living God are meant to see the world differently, meant to see reality differently. When the matrix came out, every pastor's favorite analogy for like all of the 90s or whenever that came out was what? The scene. There's the red pill. There's the blue pill. You can take the red pill and you can stay kind of in this bliss, but this isn't true reality, but it's nice. Or you could take the blue pill. You can see reality as it is, but it's disturbing, right? So every pastor used this a lot, and it's been 20 years, so I'm going to use it again now. We are meant to be people who take the blue pill, see reality as it truly is, except for us, it doesn't bring stress because reality is I'm not in control, God is in control, and that's a good thing. All of a sudden, I can rest, not trying to hold up the universe as I was never meant to. I can let God be God, and I can just be free to be a creature and rest in him, knowing that he's going to take care of everything. Taking the blue pill, for us, brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. All of a sudden, my weaknesses aren't something to be ashamed of. They're something to boast in. Why? Because now I can go to the true source of strength. My strength is found in him. Now, I'm not looking to others for my satisfaction. I realize he's the only one that can truly satisfy. And now I can actually freely love other people because I'm not trying to get anything from them. You see that, how it totally flips reality. We are meant to be a people who see the world differently, see with different eyes. Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't see as the rest of the world sees. Rather be transformed. Renew your mind to see true reality and all of a sudden discern what is the will of God. That's how we're meant to see. That's what the Corinthians have fundamentally forgotten. Their eyes have drifted down so much to man's abilities that they're denying the resurrection because they've so taken their eyes off of God. Don't follow their example. That's the first question. How will the dead be raised? God will do it. Real easy, right? How will the dead be raised? God will do it. Set your eyes on him. Second question, verse 35. What kind of body, sorry, verse 35 was the second question. What kind of body will be raised? So how will the dead be raised? God will do it. Next question. What body is going to get out of the ground if we're going to be resurrected? These old decaying bodies, that sounds like fun. Again, that's their attitude. Here's Paul's answer to the second question. What kind of body will be raised? Verse 38. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish, and there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, and the glory of the heavenly is, is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another kind. There is the glory of the sun, and another glory for the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star, for star differs from star in glory. Make sense? I don't need to explain this. Let's move on to verse, I'm just kidding. Uh, what in the world is Paul talking about? Uh, sidebar, study tip. When you get to passages like this that are just real bogged down and you're, you're in the trees, your first reaction should be zoom out and remember the forest, okay? 
What in the world is Paul talking about? Well, let's, let's zoom out. Okay, what, what's happening? The Corinthians are dying the res- denying the resurrection. They're asking, specifically, what kind of body will be raised. And so Paul here is actually, in answering them, going to point back to creation. He's going to point back to creation. In creation, Genesis 1, days 1, 2, and 3 are God creating space, right? He creates the uh, day and the night, day one. Day two, waters in the skies. Wait, skies, waters, there you go. Uh, And uh, day three, the land, right? Separates the waters from the land. So he's creating space. In days four, five, six, he's filling that space with stuff. Okay, day four fills the day and the night with sun and moon and stars. Day five fills the waters in the skies with fish and with birds. And then day six fills the land with animals and humans. And over and over again, as we see in Genesis 1, a constant kind of uh, refrain we see is one like this, Genesis 1.21. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm, notice this, according to their own kinds. Again, remember that question, what kind of body will be raised? According to their own kinds and every winged bird, according to its kind. Okay, so that's the question. What kind of body will be raised? What Paul is saying here, answer, again, very simple, the kind God makes. The kind that God makes. You've forgotten who it is that created every kind of body on the earth and in heaven. Again, what have they done? Taken their eyes off of God onto man, and they've forgotten the creator, right? Their big problem is, how would this happen? I don't know. How about the God of the universe, when there was nothing, said, let there be light, and created every kind of body in the skies and on the land? He makes a kind of resurrected body. That seems possible, right? That's Paul's kind of answer to them, pointing back to creation. They've taken their eyes off of the creator, and as a result, they've (laughs) completely missed, again, who their God is, the creator God. If you see as man sees, of course, again, the resurrection is a ridiculous idea. This old body that the eyes are going to dim, the hearing's going to go, you know, uh, even the best athletes have to retire because their bodies can't take it anymore. Tom Brady, Just retired at 97. He couldn't go. He couldn't make it to 100 because his body can't take it anymore. Okay, LeBron will have to retire one day. We don't know if he'll beat Brady, but, right, even the best of the best, the the best physical specimens, their bodies give out one day. Of course, the resurrection would be ridiculous. Uh, Whenever Claudia and I were just friends, and I was like, I want to be more than friends, and she was like, I don't know what she was thinking because I was just like, hmm, okay. I, I lent her my pen, and she didn't say thank you. Does she like me? Right, that's what's going through my head. So we're in Australia, and we're at at morning tea, which is a cultural thing in Australia. It's a great thing, 10 a.m. I have my coffee, and I was walking by Claudia and accidentally bumped into her. Uh, Not hard, but just bumped into her. And she turned around, and she poked my chest, and she said what she thought was a compliment. Oh, you're not as as soft as you look. (laughs) And I thought, I guess I will... Win her over with my personality, okay? (laughs) Not my soft body, okay, right? How is this soft body going to inherit eternity, walk around in glory for eternity? That's the question the Corinthians are asking. I sprained my ankle last year playing my one-year-old in soccer, okay? I don't want to be in this body for forever. It would be ridiculous if it's up to man, but we know it's not up to man. It's up to, as Paul would say, the creator of the universe, What kind of body will pop out of the ground? Corinthians are asking, Paul's simply saying, the kind remade, renewed, and transformed by the God who said, let there be light when there was none. Again, very simple answer, God, right? Sunday school answer that the Corinthians have missed something so obvious because their eyes have fallen to man. Look at verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable is raised Uh, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there there is also a spiritual body. So the God who made all kinds of flesh in heaven and earth is the same God who's going to make your body transform to a new kind of body. Literally, 
This body is going to go into the ground. God will raise it and transform it. And notice this picture here that Paul's painting. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. The eyes that no longer work anymore. The ears that can no longer hear anymore. The body that's been ravaged by sickness and disease and ultimately death will go into the ground and will be raised imperishable, free from the curse of death, without any tears, without any pain, no more decay, infinitely alive and unable to not be intimately, or inti- infinitely, I guess intimately alive, infinitely alive, right? Sin has been completely removed. Every tear has been wiped away. J.R.R. Tolkien, when he was uh, evangelizing to C.S. Lewis, when Lewis was an atheist, Lewis loved the medieval myths, the stories, kind of the medieval Age And Tolkien one day on a walk just kind of said to him, Lewis would always talk about how reading these stories, he'd get this longing, this longing for something more that he couldn't quite put his hand on. And Tolkien said one day, that longing is every time you read a myth, there's a true myth behind those myths. There's a true story behind the story. And so when you read those stories, it makes you long for the true story that the creator of the universe sent his son to save rebels and to bring them into his family. There's a true myth behind the myth. And I think Tolkien, if he were with us today, would say, you know, we're reading this, what is sown perishable is raised imperishable. What does our culture long for? There's a superhero movie every other week, right? We love superhero movies, right? Marvel, what do we, what do, we do when we get around? We have those talks of, if you could be one superhero, what kind would you be? There's this longing, right? And I think if Tolkien were with us, he would say, there's a true myth behind the Marvel myth or the Justice League myth, or whatever, one day you will have a body that is imperishable. One day you will trade all of your weakness for strength. One day you will trade all of the dishonor of this body for glory. That's the hope that you have. One day that that longing that you have will be realized in the resurrection. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. All the dishonor of death will be transformed into glory. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, Jonathan Edwards in the first sermon he ever preached, uh, he titled it, why, w- or why Can Christians Be Happy? Why Can a Christian Be Happy? And his outline was profound. All your bad things, why can a Christian be happy? All of your bad things will be turned to good. All of your good things can never be taken away from you, and the best is yet to come. All of your bad things will be transformed to good. All your good things can never be taken away from you, and the best is yet to come. Or as the, the Hobbit theologian Samwise Gamgee says, all that is sad will be made untrue. All that is in dishonor will be raised in glory. All that is weak and disordered will be raised in strength. What is sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. And by that, he doesn't mean a disembodied spirit. Again, that's kind of in, in popular culture, we think we're just souls floating around in a skin suit. That's from Plato. That's not from the scriptures. What Paul means here is, is what drives your body, what drives your resurrected body. N.T. Wright, who's kind of the, the, the primary thinker on the resurrection in modern times, writes this in his work, The Resurrection of the Son of God. This adjective, the adjective meaning spiritual body, spiritual there, uh, the adjective describes not what something is composed of, but what something is animated by. It is the difference between speaking of a ship made of steel or wood on the one hand and a ship driven by steam or wind on the other. So not disembodied spirit. What Paul's getting at here is your, your natural body will be sown, this, this flesh that's prone to wander, this flesh that's prone for your eyes to go down, to look away from God, will be raised driven completely by the Spirit. Almost this image of all you can do, the only possibilities you have are bearing the fruit of the Spirit because the Spirit is what drives you in the resurrection. So, Corinthians miss all of this, all of this glory. Why? Because their eyes have drifted down. So again, as we look at this, do you see with these eyes? Do you see, does the hope of the eternal resurrection hang before your eyes as what you're looking towards? Does the future glorified, imperishable, strong, resurrected body transform how you see sickness now? Transform how you see suffering now? The worst pains now, does it transform how you see them? Harvey and Joe, I have two kids that I mention in every sermon. I'm just kidding. Well, I am going to mention them again. Uh, Harvey and Joe, as their kids, fall down a lot, like a lot. 
uh, and cry. And so Claudia and I go scoop them up and we just tell them it's okay. You know, we know they just bumped their knee and this is painful. That's all they can see now. But we know there's, there's life on the other side of this. That will stop hurting in 11 seconds, but they don't know that now. So we're just constantly telling them it's okay. It's okay. We love you. I know it hurts. It'll be okay. And Joe, our little one-year-old who is just learning how to walk, falls a lot. And even if she like barely stumbles, now she says, it's okay. She just constantly, it's okay, it's okay. The resurrection means you can always say, no matter how dark the valley, how, how painful the wound, you can always say, it's okay, and be saying something true. Be declaring a true reality. It will be okay. All of your bad things will be turned to good. Everything's sad will be made untrue in the resurrection. Here's how Paul puts it in Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, as daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children than heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So stop right there. That's reality, right? We've been adopted. We've been saved. We call God Father, Abba. We cry out to him and we're awaiting future glorification. And look at verse 18. Because of all that, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. What, what a weapon in your hand to face every sorrow this world could throw at you. To know the God of the universe declares everything sad will be made untrue. Everything dishonorable will turn to glory in the resurrection. The suffering of this world aren't even worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you see with those eyes? Do you see one another with those eyes? Again, this isn't just your future. It's the future of your brother and sister in Christ sitting next to you. In fact, C.S. Lewis, reflecting on this reality that we will one day be raised in glorified bodies, says this in his uh, sermon, The Weight of Glory. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. Little g. He's not saying something heretical. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can, talk, uh, you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendship, all love, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Lewis is saying, because of who your neighbor, your brother and sister in Christ, will one day be, you should never relate to them the same again. They also will be raised in power, raised in glory. What a, what, a, what a glorious thing to think of. How can I love this person who's really annoying me, knowing what is the future God has set before them? One day they will be raised in power and in glory as well. And then lastly, get, look, back at, uh, look back at the text. Notice this. So they ask this question, what kind of body will be raised? Do you notice Paul's answer? A glorious one. A glorious one. He doesn't give them the answer they want, which is the details. I want to know how this is going to happen. This doesn't make intellectual sense to me. Explain to me what it is. And Paul just simply says, God will do it and it will be glorious, right? It's similar to Job. Uh, book of Job. Job is this guy who honors God and the Lord allows the devil to basically take everything away from him. And he cries out to God and says, why did this happen? And at the end of the book, God shows up. And he doesn't answer a single question Job has asked the entire time. All he says is, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the universe? What measuring stick did you use? What was it like to tell the sea where it can stop, that it can't come any further? What's it like to create every living being in the universe? Surely, you know, what does he do? He gives him a glimpse of how glorious his God is. And Job says, I spoke without knowledge. And he's satisfied and he worships. What Paul is doing with this kind of arrogant question, what kind of body 
will we be raised? And he says, a glorious one that God will make. Essentially what he's saying is, just trust your God's character. God's going to do something. And God does far more than we could ever ask or imagine. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart imagined what God has prepared for those who loved him. I want my two kids uh, to trust me, okay? I give them when they have questions, when Harvey asks us questions, if I can understand what he's saying. I give them answers because I love them, but ultimately, I want him just to trust me. I want him just to trust my character. And when you hit with God that point where you say, I don't understand, I don't understand how you could be in the midst of this pain. I don't understand how you could be sovereign over this. Don't you see all this mess that's happening? We need to have that reaction of, but I do not doubt your love. I do not doubt your infinite wisdom, your care for me. I don't see how it's possible, but I know it's true that you love me, that you're seeing this. That's why it's so vital that you know your God, that you don't just know about him, that you know him. You can trust his character. Charles Spurgeon says this, the great Baptist pastor of the 20th century. God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Have that reaction. God does far more. Don't let your eyes drift down to man. You have a God who is infinitely good and you can trust his character. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his his heart. Paul is saying, you don't need to know every detail. You need to know your God is glorious and loving, and the future he has laid out for you is glorious, far better than you can ever imagine. That's Paul's answer. I love that. So how will the dead be raised? God will do it. What kind of body will be raised? A glorious one that God will make. And then the last question isn't a question that the Corinthians explicitly asked, but Paul knows they must know the answer to this one, and it is, how will God raise the body? We know God, how will it happen? How will the body be raised? God will do it, but how will God do it? How can these things be? How will God raise the body? Look at verse 45. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. So we know God raises the body. How will the dead be raised? God will do it. But how will God do it? And Paul, in answering that question that he kind of plants in there, calls back and compares the first Adam, Adam, with the last Adam, Jesus, which he's already done. If you remember a couple weeks ago, he said, for in Adam, all die and Jesus Christ, all will be made alive. He compares them. He's going to do that again. So the first man, look at Adam, the first man became a living being. Here he's quoting, thus it is written, he's quoting Genesis 2, 7, the story of God making Adam, scoops up some dirt, molds him, shapes him, and then breathes life into his nostrils. And as he breathes life, this dirt shape becomes a living being. He becomes Adam, the first man. And we know how the story goes, takes one chapter for this man to rebel, this man of the dirt, to rebel against his creator who breathed life into him. And what's the sentence of this man of the dirt? From dirt you were taken, and to dirt, to dust, you will return, right? And so equally, all who are from Adam, you and I, are in this kind of hopeless state. What do we have awaiting for all of us? Dirt, death, right? From from dust we we were taken to dust, we will return. And because of the rebellion of the first Adam, this first one from the dirt, the one from heaven was sent, the last Adam. The last Adam didn't become a living being. Look at verse 45 again. He doesn't become a living being. What does he become? A life-giving spirit. Paul here is almost certainly alluding to Ezekiel 37, which if you know the story, Ezekiel the prophet is taken before this big valley of dry bones, all these dead bones. All the people of Adam have gone back to the dirt and just their bones remain. And God tells Ezekiel this, uh, tells him to prophesy this to the bones, to these dead bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know 
that I am the Lord. And the chapter keeps going and God puts his spirit within them. They become this living army. And it's this beautiful picture of the promised resurrection, of, of, of transformation, of God putting his spirit within people. Paul, by alluding to this, is essentially saying, Jesus came not just as another living man, but as the one who gives life itself to man, to woman, to all those made of the dirt. Again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, though he may die, yet he will live in the same way that God breathed life into Adam. He became a living being. Jesus Christ breathes life, will breathe life into our dead bodies as we've gone down to the dirt and we will become a resurrected being. Paul drawing this parallel, this beautiful parallel. Uh, In the early church, we just finished uh, last year going through church history. The early church is kind of my favorite area of study as there's all these controversies over Is Jesus God? Is the Spirit God? And they're debating all these different things. Really, the key question that was foundational to all the big debates that took 500 years to really hammer out is this question. Can man rise up to God? Can man rise up to God? Can we, in our own strength, by our own merit, rise up to God and dwell with God, inhabit the spiritual realm, similar to the questions that the Corinthians are asking. How can this be, right? How can, how can we rise up to God? Every heretic says, yes, Arius, Nestorius, Pelagius, they all say, yes, we can rise up to God. All the heroes, all the leaders of the church say, no. We cannot rise up to God. That's fundamental of who we are. No one seeks God. We cannot rise up to God. And if the answer is no, how can we be saved if we can't rise up to God, if we can't do anything, how can we be saved if we're stuck in our sin, if we have this decaying flesh that can't dwell with God? And the answer is, if we can't rise up to God, God has to come down to us. If we can't rise up to God, God has to come down to us. And as they're really figuring out, you know, every time they would have a big fight, At the end of that big fight, as thankfully the heroes of the faith win, they write a creed. In the first big fight, they write the Nicene Creed. It says this. It's kind of a summary of what do we believe? Who is the God in whom we believe? What is true about our God and the salvation that he brings? This is the first great creed of the church. It's the only real creed that every group of Christianity is united under. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of the same essence as the the Father. Through him all things were made. That's Jesus in eternity past, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Look at this next sentence. For us and for our salvation He came down from heaven. We cannot rise up to God. How can we be saved? God has to come down to us. And so God the Son became the last Adam, came down. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He was made human. He was made the last Adam. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom shall never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son and is with the Father and, with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified and he spoke through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Calm down. Catholic means universal there, not Roman Catholic. Breathe. You're like, keep talking about your Catholic friend. I knew you were going to bring this stuff in here one day. (laughs) Calm down. It means universal. We affirm the one Baptist for the forgiveness of sins. Look at this last line. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. That's who our God is. That's the core of our faith. That's the hope that we look forward to. How can this body inhabit eternity with God. How is this earth and heaven going to be bridged? The heavenly one became an earthly one. The eternal son of God became a man of the dirt so that the people of the dirt could become sons and daughters of God. 
You see that if we're to be saved, he has to come down and become the first fruits of our resurrection. Look at verse 48. As was the man of the dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Here's the key question. Who do you belong to? Do you belong to the man of the dust only? We all do by default. Or do you also belong to the man of heaven? And if you belong to the man of heaven, do you see that everything about who he is and what he has done has everything to do with who you are and your future hope. Jesus did not just do a bunch of stuff 2,000 years ago and leave. Who he is and what he has done has every relevance for you. He was made like us so that we could be made like him. The Son of God became a man so that man could become a son of God, a daughter of God. Who he is, what he has done matters for every dream you've ever had, every plan you've ever made, all your joys, all of your fears, the next breath you're about to take, and your last breath. Because if you belong to him, it won't be your last breath. He will raise you. You have life in him. Look at Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to him. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, in the future, this is what we look forward to, he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, so shall we bear the image of the man of heaven. How are the dead raised? God will do it. So set your eyes on him. See with his eyes. See true reality. What kind of body will be raised? A glorious one that God will make new, that God will transform. So trust his character, the one who can do far more than you can ever ask or think. And how will God raise man? From the dirt, he sends his son to become a man of the dirt so that you and I could become children, could become sons and daughters of God. Romans 8, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's who your God is. That's your salvation and that's your hope. Who do you belong to? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible reality that we have no hand in. This isn't some great building that we've built and that we can stand back and marvel in. This is something you've done completely by your grace so that we can <laughs> marvel and worship and be filled with joy and can ask these questions. Who, who, what is man that you are mindful of him? You who hung the stars, the son of man that you care for him, that you would send your son, the one whom you've eternally poured out your love on that you might bring us into your family as adopted sons and daughters. I pray that this wouldn't just be something that we see once and then think that's nice and move on, but this would be something that would hang in front of our eyes, that we wouldn't be, we wouldn't see like the world, we'd be transformed, our minds would be renewed, that we would see the God who raises us, the glorious body that awaits us, the transformation that awaits us, and the Savior that made it possible, that we would see that our life is in Christ and that every pain, every wound, no matter how deep, every darkness, every temptation wouldn't be worth comparing to the glory. We praise you for who you are, and we thank you for your son, and we pray in his name. Amen.